Welcome back to the neurology section of 12 Days in March. Today we'll launch part three, the final installment of content for our stroke series. Here's another reminder of our big picture in the stroke series. In part one, we discussed territorial infarctions off the circle of Willis. In part two, we discussed lacunar infarctions related to disease of the deep penetrating vessels. And in this episode of 12 Days, we'll tackle brainstem strokes. The hallmark of brainstem strokes will be cranial nerve involvement. After that, a functional understanding of brainstem anatomy should help you answer any question you'll see about brainstem infarctions on step one. We'll use our rule of fours as our guide through this video. And don't forget, before concluding, we'll talk about what happens when the anterior spinal artery or artery of Adamkovich is occluded. As this diagram suggests, below a particular dermatomal level, all that will be spared is vibratory sensation. We'll show you why and how it makes intuitive sense. So how can you tell quickly if an acute stroke localizes to the brainstem? Boom, that's how. When cranial nerves are affected, you know the stroke is in the brainstem instantly. By the way, expect to be shown this gross anatomical image on test day and be asked to identify at least one specific cranial nerve based on location. There are some free points for you. You're welcome. So let's do a quick refresher on brainstem anatomy and which cranial nerves originate from each of the three major brainstem regions. First, cranial nerves one and two don't belong to the brainstem at all. They're too cool for us, so we won't be discussing them at all today. The midbrain is the most cranial brainstem region, that is the region closest to the forebrain. Cranial nerves three and four originate from the midbrain. The pons is home to cranial nerves five, six, seven, and eight. And in case you need some help remembering where the pons is, just look for the big fat belly in the middle of the brainstem and you found your pons. Let's throw the medulla into the mix. This segment connects the rest of the brainstem to the spinal cord and is home to cranial nerves 9, 10, 12, and cranial nerve 11. To help us remember all of that and some additional important anatomy, let's refresh ourselves on the brainstem rule of fours. This golden set of four rules will be our guiding light, our set of commandments, if you will, through the remainder of this video. Rule number one is that there are four midline structures beginning with the letter M, including the MLF that controls a deduction of the ipsilateral eye past midline, motor control for the contralateral body and certain ipsilateral cranial nerves, and the medial lemniscus, which carries contralateral vibration and proprioception info to the thalamus, will be most concerned with the motor structures for this video. Rule number two states that there are four lateral structures all beginning with the letter S, including sensory tracts for pain and temperature. These two sensory tracts consist of the trigeminal fibers carrying pain and temperature info from the ipsilateral face and the spinal thalamic tract carrying pain and temperature info from the contralateral body. This is massive. Anytime you recognize that pain and temperature sensation are impaired in one side of the face and the opposite side of the body, you can instantly localize a lesion to the lateral brainstem. I repeat, a lesion to the lateral brainstem is the only thing that can cause crossed pain and temperature loss between the face and the body on the boards. The other two tracts in the lateral brainstem are the spinocerebellar tract, which controls coordination for the ipsilateral limbs, and the sympathetic tract for the ipsilateral body. Rule number three divides up the cranial nerves by region. Just like we saw before, there are four cranial nerves in the medulla, four in the pons, and four above the pons, only two of which actually belong to the midbrain. And our fourth rule is that the cranial nerve motor nuclei that divide evenly into the number 12, that is three, four, six, and 12, are all in the midline. All other motor nuclei for the cranial nerves are in the lateral brainstem, including five, seven, nine, and 10. We'll return to the rule of fours during our discussion of brainstem pathology. Next, it's time for a field trip to review the blood supply to each part of the brainstem. Now for the brainstem blood supply, the pica supplies the lateral medulla and the ica, further superiorly, gets the lateral pons. Note that they both supply only to the lateral brainstem and not to the medial. That's important. The vertebral arteries supply blood to the medial medulla, and the basilar artery forms at the base of the pons and supplies the medial pons with blood. 
So let's drill down bit by bit where each region of the brainstem receives its blood supply. It'll be important when we get to the stroke pathologies. The left and right vertebral arteries supply blood to the medial left and right medulla. The pica supplies blood to the lateral medulla. The basilar artery forms from the union of the two vertebral arteries at the base of the pons and supplies blood to the medial pons. And the ica supplies blood to the lateral pons. The hardest two of these to remember are the ica and the pica, since they basically both sound exactly the same. The best mnemonic we have is that Mike and Ica's make you fat because the Pons has a big fat belly. If you come up with a better mnemonic, please email us at 12 days. So what about the midbrain? The answer is that none of the above blood vessels supply blood to the midbrain and you won't be asked to localize a midbrain stroke to a particular artery. The reason why is because the PCA, the posterior cerebral artery, is the major blood supplier to the midbrain. And if the PCA is occluded, you'll be expected to know the visual field deficit of the two missing half donuts. If you're a chart person, this one's for you. With that background information out of the way, let's get into the specific findings for the important brainstem strokes. We'll begin with ICA and PICA occlusion, which causes a stroke in the lateral pons and lateral medulla, respectively. The resulting constellation of symptoms will naturally have a fair bit of overlap since they both hit the lateral structures of the brainstem. First, we'll review what these syndromes share in common, then we'll discuss how to distinguish them. Remember the rule of fours to predict what deficits will come from whacking the structures in the lateral brainstem beginning with the letter S, which includes both the sensory tracts, both spinothalamic and trigeminal, the spinocerebellar tract, and the sympathetic tract. First and most importantly, both ICA and PICA strokes will cause crossed sensory deficits with the ipsilateral face unable to sense pain and temperature. Ditto for the contralateral body. On the boards, only an ICA or PICA stroke can cause crossed pain and temperature loss. That's why this is a dead giveaway for a lateral brainstem stroke. Next is the spinocerebellar tract, which causes ataxia with a tendency to fall towards the ipsilateral side of the lesion. Finally, the sympathetic fibers run from the hypothalamus through the lateral brainstem and into the spinal cord. When a lateral brainstem stroke occurs, you can expect an ipsilateral Horner's syndrome with a droopy eyelid and constricted pupil, that is ptosis and meiosis. The side of the Horner's syndrome is the easiest way to lateralize the lesion to the left or the right since it's on the same side as the stroke. So how in the heck are you going to tell these two apart? With the brainstem, it always comes back to cranial nerves. Different cranial nerves will be whacked since we're dealing with different parts of the brainstem with ICA and PICA strokes. We'll be dealing with the motor nuclei that reside in the lateral brainstem, not those four in the medial brainstem. So this means that for the pons, we'll be whacking cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve, which controls ipsilateral facial muscles. And for the medulla, we'll be whacking cranial nerves 9 and 10, which control speech, the gag reflex, and the swallowing muscles on one side. This is because the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerve motor nuclei are in a structure called the nucleus ambiguous in the lateral medulla. Ica and pica strokes share a ton of similar features, but you'll need these cranial nerve deficits to differentiate between the two and localize the lesion. Remember that lateral pontine syndrome includes Bell's palsy and that lateral medullary syndrome, aka Wallenberg syndrome, includes dysphagia, hoarseness, and decreased gag reflex. Bell's palsy occurs because of facial nerve paralysis and is different than the facial droop of an MCA or lacunar stroke. Every muscle on one side of the face is affected, unlike an MCA or lacunar stroke, which only causes a lower but not upper facial droop. The dysphagia in lateral medullary syndrome occurs because the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves are instrumental for motor control during swallowing, and that motor control is now gone on one side. And here's a Venn diagram to drive it all home. In the center are the shared features for any lateral brainstem stroke, which include crossed pain and temperature loss, first and foremost, but also in ipsilateral Horner's syndrome and ataxia. An ICA stroke hits the lateral pons and damages the facial nerve motor nucleus. This leads to Bell's palsy on the ipsilateral face, 
A pica stroke will not do this. And a pica stroke will cause dysphagia or swallowing difficulty from damage to cranial nerves nine and 10, which together control swallowing. You might also be presented with hoarseness and decreased gag reflex, just be aware. The MEME won't ask you any derivatives about ICA or pica strokes per se, because they think that it's hard enough to remember which controls which. So they will expect you to be able to tell the difference between ICA and pica strokes. Now you have the tools to do that. All right, let's move on to basilar artery occlusion. Recall that the basilar artery supplies blood to the medial pons, and from the rule of fours, this means that the medial brainstem contains all of the motor tracts, specifically the corticospinal and corticobulbar tracts bilaterally. So an infarction to the medial pons will knock out all motor function bilaterally. However, the motor input for the extraocular muscles is spared since it comes from above the basilar artery in the midbrain, which has good collateral blood supply. The result is a patient who is completely paralyzed and can't even speak. All they can do is move their eyes and blink, a phenomenon called locked-in syndrome. And through all of this, the patient remains fully conscious and aware of everything that's going on. That's why locked-in syndrome is my worst nightmare. The MDME will likely ask you to either identify a stroke in the basilar artery as causing locked-in syndrome, or they may describe the syndrome and ask what else could cause a similar patient presentation. The answer is central pontine myelinolysis from overzealous correction of hyponatremia. Remember this association as low to high, the pons will die. Although unlikely, you might be asked about medial medullary syndrome. All you need to know is that ipsilateral hypoglossal nerve palsy is the result where the tongue deviates to the same side as the lesion. The reason they won't ask you to localize this lesion is because the medial medulla actually gets blood supply from two vessels, the vertebral artery and the anterior spinal artery, and so both can cause medial medullary syndrome if occluded. I wouldn't sweat this one as you're much more likely to be asked about our previous three brainstem strokes. And for the grand finale, let's review what happens when the anterior spinal artery is occluded below the brainstem. Let's say that the anterior spinal artery is occluded and causes an infarction of the spinal cord. Take a look at this diagram where everything affected is in red and everything not affected is in white. What will the patient present with? Sudden onset paralysis on both sides with bilateral pain and temperature sensory loss. However, vibration and proprioception sensation will be spared because the posterior columns are just fine. The anatomical minutia they'll ask you about is the specific name of the artery that's occluded, which is the artery of a Dankovich. All right, that is it for new content. Let's quickly summarize what we learned for brainstem strokes. It all revolves around the cranial nerves in the brainstem. If no cranial nerves are affected, it ain't brainstem. We discussed lateral pontine and lateral medullary syndromes and how these two are the only pathologies which will present with loss of pain and temperature sensation on opposite sides of the patient's face and body. You can instantly narrow down to ICA and PICA stroke when you identify cross pain and temperature loss, and then just look for what else they throw at you. Bell's palsy equals an ICA stroke because Mike and ICAs make you fat like the pawns. Then a PICA stroke causes dysphagia and basilar artery stroke will cause locked in syndrome. And for anterior cord syndrome, where the patient can't move bilaterally or feel pain and temperature, but can feel vibration, Remember that the artery of Radamkovich is occluded. And you did it. Three videos up, three videos down. You are now an expert at localizing strokes. Congratulations. And oh yeah, before you go, burn this brain into your brain. I guarantee you will see it on test day. That does it for content in our stroke series. If you wanna put those skills to the test, our next video will provide sample board style questions. And as always, feel free to email howard at 12daysinmarch.com with any questions.